and you want a team to go down your street or apartment complex there where you live, if you want to volunteer your street for a team, uh, please do so. Uh, we're not going to send you down your own street because you've lived amongst your neighbors for so long. We're going to send people that they don't know <laughs> Uh, to, to go down that street. If you would like to do that tomorrow, who of you kind of think, well, that's interesting. I would like a team to go down my street. I want to volunteer my street and place. Okay, just put up your hands. Show us your hands. Okay, a good number. That's if you live in Bowling Green. We can't go to any other towns on Saturday. If you would like to do that tomorrow night, if you can print out from MapQuest or so, a map of your area that shows how to get from the church there or, you know, how, where it's situated in Bowling Green so that people can actually find it and mark it out from which block to which block you would like the people to go. Write your name on that printout and just hand it to, to, uh, to us or to uh, John and Jennifer or at the table or whatever. Just give it to us so that we can kind of plan ahead for Saturday and we will incorporate those streets into the outreach on Saturday. Okay, now we're coming to what this thing is going to look like, what Jesus commanded us. We see that we need to go, we need to go and preach the gospel. How are we going to do this? There's two major passages that Jesus uses, Matthew 10 and Luke 10. And, and the best example of that really is in Acts 10, uh, so I always tell people it's Matthew 10, Luke 10, Acts 10. So that's easy to remember. Okay? But we're going to go in, in, on page, is it 6? On page 6, uh, we're going to go to Luke 10. And I want Elena just to read this, the, the, the passage there, and then we're going to look at what this looks like. Okay, we're going to concentrate on Luke 10. We kind of put it parallel to Matthew 10 because many of the things overlap, but, you know, for the purpose of time, we're just going to look at Luke 10. Luke 10, verse 1. Now, after these things, the Lord also appointed 70, 70 others and sent them two by two ahead of him into every city and place where he was about to come. Now, okay, he's sending them out to cities and villages. Do you think when he then said to them at the end, go into all the world and starting in Jerusalem and Samaria and, and whatever, do you think that this pattern and the instructions that he had first given them to go to different cities would still have been in them and the practice that they had? Okay. Then he said to them, the harvest is indeed plentiful, but the laborers are few. Pray therefore to the Lord of the harvest that he may send out laborers into his harvest. Go your ways. Behold, I send you out as lambs among wolves. Carry no purse, no wallet, nor sandals. Greet no one on the way. Into whatever house you enter, first say, Peace be to this house. If a man of peace is there, your peace will rest on him. But if not, it will return to you. Remain in that same house, eating and drinking the things they give, for the laborer is worthy of his wages. Don't go from house to house. Into whatever city you enter and they receive you, eat the things that are set before you. Heal the sick who are therein and tell them, the kingdom of God has come near you. But into whatever city you enter and they don't receive you, this is on page 7, the second column, Go into its streets and say, even the dust from your city that clings to us we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near you. Whoever listens to you, I'm skipping on to verse 16, whoever listens to you listens to me, and whoever rejects you rejects me. Whoever rejects me rejects him who sent me. And on page 8, verse 17, the seventy returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. He said to them, I saw Satan having fallen like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Nothing will in any way hurt you. I, nevertheless, don't rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. In that same hour, Jesus rejoiced in the Holy Spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, 
that you have hidden these things from the wise and the understanding and revealed them to the little children. Yes, Father, for so it was well-pleasing in your sight. Okay, praise the Lord. Now, just as you look at the beginning there of Luke 10, what is so interesting, and we don't have time tonight to go and do that, but go and read the few verses before in chapter 9, and you will see there Jesus is talking to the one person after the other, asking them to come and follow him because he wants to send them into the harvest. And he's getting the one excuse after the other. We are finding the same thing as we are going out talking to people and saying, it's harvest time. Oh, brother, you know, we're busy. Oh, you know, this, we can't do this. Oh, uh, you know, uh, 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 <laughs> hello? It's like people have all kinds of excuses the same way that they did with Jesus. But then it says 72 others. Those are the ones that actually said yes. I want to ask you, how many of you tonight are those that say yes? I can't hear you. Okay. So he said, they, so he said he's sending them, again, apostello, right? He's sending them out two by two. And we prefer to do three just for this reason that... Um, you know, it is better, although sometimes people, it goes in twos also, but uh, it just works well in terms of not looking like the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons and whatever. And, and then also, if you have uh, two girls or two guys, it's sometimes difficult, so we, we take two guys and a girl or two girls and a guy. It just works well that way. But they go in teams. This is team ministry. Okay. This is good. So they, he sends them out, and then he told them, and, and we will at the end just do this again. Uh, he, he told them to ask the Lord of the harvest to send laborers. How many of you remember from last night? Where are these laborers? In the harvest. Are they saved yet? No. So we must go and ask the Father to send into our path. And that word sent, there is not the word apostello. It's the word ekbalo, which means the same thing to cast out demons. It's that kind of violent thing almost that the, that the Father needs to just throw into our path as we are in the harvest. These people that are going to be laborers. Okay. Then he says to them again, I am sending you. I am apostelling you. As wolves amongst lambs. Oh, no, 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 no. Lambs amongst wolves. <laughs> wolves amongst lambs. Anyway, we don't want those. So why does he say lambs among wolves? Innocence. Somebody said. Gentle spirits. It's that dependency. You see, the kingdom of heaven works from a place of weakness. Hello? We work in our society from a place of strength. In fact, in a lot of the church, we rather honor strength and success than weakness. And we model to people success and strength rather than weakness. And we have this idea that if you are very successful and full of strength and human ability, that you're actually being blessed by God. But he's looking for weak vessels where it is his glory and power that is getting the job done through them. It's that utter dependency on him. So if you are like an athlete or a jock or whatever, or, uh, uh, you know, you, you're an eloquent speaker or you're this or that, and you think of it, man, I can go and do this stuff. God's going to knock you down. So that you come to a place of weakness and humility. What we have found as we have been doing this, we did this for six months in, in Mount Pleasant, it was some of the weakest vessels that were the most effective in the harvest. The people you least expected became the boldest, boldest, and the most fiery in the harvest. So, all right. So then he says, uh, uh, there, uh, Leonard can talk about that, where they say, no, or whatever. 
Again, I mean, this is the way Jesus sends them out. Let me just get the verse here. Okay. He says, go your ways. Behold, I send you as lambs among wolves. Carry no purse, no wallet, no sandals. Greet no one on the way. And then I always say, this is why we know it can't work in America. Because we can't take our purses with us. So... <laughs> We love our purses. But, you know, just again, think about it. No purse, no wallet, no extra provision or whatever. The, the inset cost for evangelism, Jesus' way, was zero or very minimal uh, sending them out that way. Maybe that's an adjustment that we, we need to make. And, um, and then he also says, greet no one on the way. Why? Why? Yes. Don't get distracted. They needed to reach that town and that village for a specific purpose to, to do it there. Have you ever found sometimes you get this great idea, maybe it's just an idea, or maybe it's something that the Lord actually gave you, and it's so alive in your heart that you want to do this, and you start talking about it, and you're just babbling about it and telling everyone about it, and in the end, you bleed the whole thing off and you don't actually do it. You were just talking about it. <laughs> Sometimes it's, it's good to keep that motivation bottled up in the inside and actually to carry it with you and to discharge it at the right time and in the right place and something will actually happen instead of just enthusiastically babbling about it everywhere you go. So, okay. Then he says... Into whatever house you enter, first say, peace be to this house. So again, they're not just looking for a stray individual on the road. They're looking for a house that they need to enter. It says, first say, peace be to this house. If a man of peace is there, your peace will rest on him. But if not, it will return to you. Okay. So what is this man of peace. Who is a man of peace? She says, is that Seabok? Well, you know all about this already. You're not allowed to say this. You've been in the training before. <laughs> um, so she says, it's somebody that is unsafe, but is welcoming you into their home. They're welcoming the message. So some of you said, Jesus, this is Jesus sending them. How can he be the man of peace? Hello? Do you understand? As, we read, as you read the scripture, you've got to start to put yourself there. You know, there's so many, I almost want to say, cliche things and, and sayings that have been handed down to us that we don't even think sometimes. And so it's important that you really start to say, Lord, I want to live myself into these situations and start to see what is Jesus doing and trying to teach us some people think we are the man of peace now yes you need to be full of peace you need to be a carrier of peace but he is looking for people who is unsaved but receives you now it says that don't go house to house so some people say why do you go door to door what he is saying is when they would enter a town and they found a house that welcomes them, that's where they need to minister from. So when we came into the Toledo area, we went and stayed with John and Jennifer Neiman, and we've been staying there ever since. Bless them. I mean, they have been just such a blessing to us. Let's just give them a hand. Yes. <laughs> Hallelujah. But... We have gone to many houses and ministered in many houses. And when you go to the book of Acts, you see they went from house to house. So he is not meaning you should not go from house to house. The reason why we, even though I believe there's many elements in treasure hunts that are very good. The reason I don't like treasure hunts is because it's random. But when you do door to door, you have the address of where the people live. And we, because we are not just after having a random experience, we are looking for a house to enter. Understand this. In this model, Jesus did not tell them, tell them to come to my place. Come on. 
He did not tell them, tell them to come to where I'm ministering in the synagogue. He says, you go to their house. Can you see the huge shift that Jesus is bringing to our thinking? Because we've so been dependent, they've always got to come to our house. And even if we then think, well, a house is better than a church building, then still a Christian house. Come on. I have a life group, so they must come to my life group. No, he says, you must go to the house of the sinner. And you must look for a way to enter his house. So when we go door to door, we tell the people, part of your job or part of your agenda is actually to enter their house. If they will welcome you in, this is a good sign. You are looking for that. This is so important. It's the man, you, you want to enter their house. The reason why we go door to door is we're looking for the man of peace. Now you will lead a number of people to the Lord that are not necessarily that one that end, opens their door, but you continue to minister to everyone on that street until you find the one that gives you entrance. Because that's where you want to set up the kingdom. And he says, there they must preach the kingdom and heal the sick. Now, let me ask you this. Once this happens, do they then leave again and bring those people with them? A few of you say, no, the rest of you are giving me that deer in the headlights. Look, what is it meaning now? They leave and come and report back to Jesus without the huge crowd that they just led to Jesus. Brother, you cannot mean that. That's what Jesus said. Is, is, is this in the Bible or not? Or, or am I making something up? Is it there? Hello? So we must have a look whether this is truly a model of Jesus. Now, I want to quickly demonstrate something to you. Pastor Draver. Yes, look. Mike, what this? I want to show you something. So... How many of you recognize what is this? Oh, oh. Okay. What is this? Yeah? But even more than that, what is the whole thing? A cluster. Okay? So what we do when we do evangelism, we look for somebody that wants to know Jesus, right? So we find somebody and we say, Oh man, you need Jesus. Come with me. Oh, he doesn't want to leave. <laughs> <laughs> so we pluck him from the cluster and we take him to the Christian fruit salad at the church. Okay? And now this is a really radical Holy Ghost church where man, they lay hands on people often. They soak in the spirit. They prophesy. They have visions and dreams. I mean, they are just having an awesome time. And this guy is getting so, uh, I mean, just messed up in the, in the spirit. He becomes a smoothie. <laughs> now, after many years of this, we tell him, you know, you actually had a cluster of friends. He's no smoothie. He has no connection with the cluster. Hello? Because we are after one person rather than the cluster. Jesus is after clusters. That's why this model is so radically different. Because we will still try and get that one to come to our church. And once he's at our church, we're satisfied with one, one to Jesus. But Jesus is not after the one. Yes, you've got to start with one. He's the man of peace. But you're after not just him, but his house and his cluster. So, in, in Isaiah 50, uh, 65... Now, you've got to go back to the, to the back of the, the, the manual. I'm going to, no, I'm not done with. Yeah, just, just get them, show them where it is. Yeah, yeah, all right. Um, it, where we talk about new wineskins. Isaiah 65. Now, 
So Jesus, how many of you remember last night? I read, to, Lena read to you out of uh, out of um, Luke uh, five from verse twenty-seven, the story of Matthew, right? So can you see your Matthew is a man of peace? Jesus finds him and he says to him, "Come, follow me." And Matthew is so excited about Jesus that he he takes Jesus. Matthew and Levi is the same guy, by the way. If some of you are reading about Levi, then you say, he's talking about Matthew. It's the same guy. Okay? So, he takes Matthew. Matthew takes Jesus to his own house, to Matthew's house. And he gets his cluster of sinners to come to his house. Can you see this? And in that environment... Of this new cluster, the Pharisees are upset that Jesus is not bringing this cluster to the synagogue. That he mixes with them there and that they don't come to the synagogue and become religious. Come on. And and it's in that environment that Jesus says, I didn't come for the righteous, but for the unrighteous. It's not the healthy that needs the doctor, but the sick. Uh, See what this means, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. We will give God a lot of sacrifices instead of going into the harvest. Okay? And there's a lot of ministry that distracts from the harvest. And as you're hearing this, you have to evaluate everything you do as a church body, as leaders, and as individuals in terms of ministry, and see whether you are apostolically harvest-minded and what distracts from the harvest. Okay? Then, he says, new wine must be poured into new wineskins. And he says, if you don't pour it into new wine, if you pour new wine into an old wineskin, the wineskin tears and the wine runs out. The reason is this. A wineskin, I'm going to just put this down just for a minute. I'll pick it up in a moment again. My hands are getting tired. So a new wineskin is a leather bag. It's a, it's, a, it's a skin of an animal that they work, and it's soft and supple, and they make it into a leather bag with a hole at the top that they can close and put a, a, a lid in or whatever, and they pour new wine. Now, new wine is, is uh, grapes that is put into a wine press, freshly harvested, put into a wine press and pressed and that fresh grape juice is poured into this wine skin and then it starts to ferment on the inside there. That is what Jesus is talking about. So, when Jesus is using this analogy, understand this. As Jesus, throughout the New Testament, he uses things that he's not just basing from the culture, but also backed up by the prophetic word of the Old Testament. Are you with me? Even though those are not quoted. So when he starts talking about new wine, new wine is spoken of many times in the historic write, in, in the prophetic writings. In your manual, there's several that I quote there for you. You've got to go and read them and watch how it talks about harvest. And new wine has to do with a fresh harvest. Are, are you with me? It's a fresh harvest that is put into a new wineskin. Not an old wineskin. Come on. Now, when I used to, in the 90s, in the move of God in the 90s, I would teach, start a revival meeting, a series of revival meetings, teaching on new wine for new wineskins, because people were getting drunk in the Holy Spirit and, and, you know, laughing and flopping all over the place. So I talked about new wine, all right? (laughs) Um, Some of you can understand why I'm saying that. Wine makes drunk, all right? Spiritually, all right? So, anyway, so, so I, I, I talked about that, and then I would say, we can renew the wine skin. But Jesus did not say, renew the old wine skin. He said, new wine into new wine skins. So, 
This is very important that you see this, that it has to do with harvest, and I don't have time to go into this, but it, he talks that even in Joel about the outpouring of the Spirit leading to harvest and new wine, the, the, the latter rain. We are in the time of the, the fullness of the latter and the former rain together for harvest. Okay? Now, coming back to this, then in Isaiah 65, and I don't know which verse it is, just see there in your manual. Um, is it 8? 65 verse 8. He talks about if there is still juice in the cluster. That juice, there, again, is the word new wine in, in the Hebrew. All right? And so he says, if there is still juice in the cluster, do not destroy it. Okay? So how, are, what, how is grapes harvested? In clusters. Now I know you're... You are have different kind of harvest. We live at the moment in, in California, and if you drive up and down the Central Valley, there's many vineyards there, and, and, and they harvest grapes in clusters. So Jesus, in Matthew 21, from verse 33, has the parable of the tenants. Have any of you read that before? Where it says he made a, wine, a, a, a vineyard, he planted a vineyard, Put a watchtower, a wall around it, a wine press and everything. And then he lent it out to tenants. And then he says, he sends, he apostellos, his servants at the time of the harvest to bring him his fruits. Come on. How, what is he talking about? Clusters of grapes. Because that's what you get in a vineyard. Are you still with me? So he said they must reap clusters of grapes. So when we just pluck one from the cluster, we actually destroy the cluster. And we leave the cluster to rot on the vine. Instead of going for the whole cluster. Hello? Are you getting this? Now... The man of peace is part of this cluster. This is his cluster. So instead of plucking him from the cluster, we want to reach his whole cluster through him. Okay. So that's the cluster of grapes. Remember this concept of the cluster. So in Matthew, you see this uh, with Matthew's house. Jesus finds a cluster there. So, when you think of a man of peace in this context, who else in the Gospels are, is a man of peace? Zacchaeus. We'll come to Cornelius. He's in the, in the book of Acts. So, Zacchaeus, Luke 19. Zacchaeus, Jesus says to him, he comes under the tree, and he says to him, and I love this, look at this, because the thing we're teaching you also is to become very intentional about the gospel and the works of Jesus. Are you with me? To become intentional. Because we sometimes have this thing. How many of you have heard about relational, uh, relational evangelism? You have a relationship for five years with somebody and never get them saved. <laughs> All right? Jesus comes to the, under the tree and he says to Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus, come down. Today, I am coming to your house. Jesus invites himself. Do you see the intentionality to enter the house of the man of peace? When Jesus enters his house, what happens? Zacchaeus invites his cluster. And in that environment, Jesus says, salvation has come to this house. I've not come for the righteous, but to seek sinners Again, he says that. In that environment, do you see Jesus is beginning to demonstrate the new wineskin is his ministry with a cluster of a, of a man of peace in a house. Who else was a man of peace? Another disciple. Peter. Peter brings Jesus to his house. Peter's mother-in-law gets healed there. The result as of what Jesus did earlier that day in the synagogue, at that evening, the whole town comes and gathers at Peter's house. 
Peter is a man of peace in his house, becomes a, a man of peace house. Now, do you see? These are like church in a house. Uh-oh. Now you said the wrong thing, brother. Church cannot be in a house. At least if it has a chimney, it has a steeple. Okay, now, why we are talking about this? This model, I want to just give you quickly a history of this that you can understand why we are doing this. This model came together. You understand this is something that has not been done in the church in a long time. Overseas on the mission field over the last 15 to 20 years max, this has been happening. This started happening in the mid-90s during the same time of the Toronto outpouring, Rottnell Brown, Brownsville, that whole outpouring. On the mission field amongst Baptist missionaries, this started happening. So they would train pastors at a Bible school. Then they would send a pastor into a remote village. And the job of this pastor was he had to start building a church building. Maybe that could sit 50 or 100 people. And then he had to start gathering people. And over a period of about five years, this process would take place. And eventually they would have a church. Except many times the pastor gets killed before this takes place. So church planting took a long time. It was difficult. Then the Lord all over the mission field in South Asia especially, God started speaking to different groups unbeknown of each other about this passage of Luke 10. And he said to them, go and look at Luke 10. So now they sent somebody into a village. Instead of trying to build a church building, they looked for a man of peace. When they found the man of peace, they entered his house, stayed there, and there planted a church with his cluster of influence. It started flourishing. He didn't get killed. So now they told them to do the same thing. So out of this house, another village was reached. And so village after village started having a church planted like this. So after a year or so, in some of these places, in 94, 95, some of these places... They would send back reports to the Baptist Missionary Board and they would say, we've planted 100 churches this year. In the last 10, 20 years, they planted five churches. This is what's going on. This is, this is suspicious. So they went and, and did research. That research you can find uh, on a website called... Um, Manual Manual on page two, meaning, you know, just the inside of your cover page. It's there. There's recommended books. Can you see it there? It says free booklet, Church Planting Movements by David Garrison. And you can download it from the web. I've told you exactly how to do it. And it's also, there's also a link on our website. Our website is called Active in the Harvest. And so you can also go and look there. And so, so what they did was they had this research. They found out it's actually true. There are places in India right now, 15 years later, where when this started happening, there was no representation of the Lord Jesus, where there is now 50,000, in other areas, 100,000 of these churches. Wow! Do you see the multiplication? Hello? Can you see the old model of just trying to fill a church building cannot have this kind of effect upon a city? Can you also see that it still then means a few people does all the ministry, but if we put the ministry in the hands of every believer and they start multiplying, we can take the city. That is the model. Now, they call these house churches. 
So, for many of you, when you hear the word house church, you think of a group of disgruntled believers that are mad at the church. Is that true or not? We want nothing to do with that. They have the mentality, us four and no more. So I call it, honey, we shrunk the church. <laughs> because they have the same problems in the small house as in the big house. And they have the same disease of not reproducing. So the Lord gave us this term. We call these harvest houses. Okay? Because it's about the harvest. We are looking for unsaved souls, sinners that will come to Jesus. That cluster of unsaved people that are gathered into a home and get saved. And there we establish the kingdom. And they become the new laborers in the harvest that will go and multiply others. So can you see that Zacchaeus' house is a harvest house? Can you see that Matthew's house is a harvest house? That Peter's house is a harvest house? Now there's a lady that I want to tell you about. Can any of you think of a lady in the, in the Gospels that was a woman of peace? Martha! Where do we read of her? Oh my goodness, you're in your notes. You're reading in the notes. It is in the notes. Sorry? What did she say? Oh, Joe is telling him. He's heard that last time at the training. Yes. All right. It is, it's there in the notes in, in, in this section on new wineskins. You will see when I talk about the houses further down. We're going to look at that part now. Um, we've not finished the new wineskin part. We're back at the end of the book again. What? I don't know. 40 something. 48. At the bottom. Okay. You're there. So, do you see there, Martha, in Luke 10, the passage that talks about the, the man of peace, here is a woman of peace, in verse 38, and it says, she, um, what is it, welcomed, or she opened her house to Jesus. Luke 10, verse 38, as Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he said. That's a harvest house. And later on, her brother gets saved there, and a whole, not saved, gets, gets resurrected from the dead, and a whole harvest of souls come in because of this family. Wow. We're about harvest. Okay, what time is it? 9.20. Can we just take two, three minutes? Do you want to take a break or can we just keep on going? I know we didn't take the second break. All right, all right. So, maybe just stop the, the CD and, and, and start another one here because we're going to go to the book of Acts now. And we've got to quickly run through this. Now, the book of Acts. The title of the book of Acts in the Greek is really the apostolic acts of the Holy Spirit. And put it this way, the apostolic acts of the Holy Spirit and the, the disciples as they advance the kingdom. Do you see? It's all about an apostolic mission that starts to circle out from Jerusalem and marches into the Gentile world. You've got to get this, this attitude in the book of Acts of we are going somewhere. And that's why our whole mentality of trying to just sit still in one place is so the opposite of what this attitude of Jesus and of the Holy Spirit is now. Jesus says this in Luke 24, 49 I will ask the Father to send Apostello the promised Holy Spirit. 
Do you understand that the same mission that Jesus had to win souls is the same mission of the Holy Spirit? Come on. And if we try to do evangelism without emphasis of the baptism with the Holy Spirit, we're actually saying we have our way of doing it in our strength and we will do human ways to try and preach the gospel rather than becoming dependent on the one that Jesus said has been sent apostolically to advance this apostolic mission. This is very serious. I don't know whether some of you understand this. We've got to honor the Holy Spirit. Then also just see this. Jesus in all of his time, even in those 40 days, still doesn't teach them about church. He demonstrates the planting the church or building the church in his ministry in the Gospels. Do you understand this? But he teaches them over and over and over the advance of the kingdom. Because he understood if they stayed single-minded to that and advanced the kingdom, the church would aggregate behind that machine. But he understood this also, that if he focused them on the establishing of the church, the advance of the kingdom would halt. That is what has happened to us. Do you understand this? That's why we've got to become single-minded about the harvest. It is not that we are neglecting the church. It's that we are becoming the church. In action for what she was made to be. She was not made to become a fat bride that sits and does nothing. That just eats and eats and eats. Come on. It's time that we slim her down. And run into the harvest. Because that's where her lover is, Jesus. That's where her husband is. Okay? So, as we march into the gospel, into the book of Acts, you must see this attitude. And so the Holy Spirit gets poured out. Now it says 3,000 come to the Lord. So where do they put these people? They don't have a huge church building. They start gathering from house to house. And there's only 12 apostles and 120 new belie- other believers, leaders. But 3,000 got saved. So now they are dispersing all of these people amongst all of them. And they are beginning to multiply in these houses from house to house. This starts happening in Jerusalem. In the houses. They're finding another harvest house, another harvest house, another harvest house. When it says the Lord added to their number daily, it is not that another person came to the church service on Sunday morning. It meant that these believers were winning the lost in the harvest amongst the houses as they went from house to house. Do you get this? So, that because we have this idea, when we see this passage, we say, Lord, add to our numbers, send people to our church. We have prayer meetings where we pray to the north, the south, the east, the west. And we call them in. Come on. Then we go on prayer walks. I want to ask you, how many lampposts got saved? We were in the UP and Hamilton said this, how many lampposts got saved? And somebody piped up, he said, not many, but they all saw the light. (laughs) You see, we think that if we had prayer walked, we had already evangelized. We think the city has changed, they will come to us. Now, how many of you know we need to do spiritual warfare? 
So have a look at this. I know we're going into the book of Acts, but I need to just show you this. When the, when the 72 returns, it says, they say, the demons submit to us. I mean, the first thing that they are excited about is demons submitting to them. They had such a confrontation with darkness that the demons ran. Ordinary, simple people scared the devil. Wow! Jesus says, I saw Satan fall like lightning. When did that happen? Hello? When did that happen? What is he talking about? All right, you're not getting it, so let me show you. When they preached the kingdom and healed the sick in the house of the man of peace, the principalities and powers in that region came down. Preaching the gospel is the most powerful form of spiritual warfare. That's how you tear the principalities down. That's where the war is. On the doorstep, when you face the darkness in that house, and you speak the light of Jesus into that house, and you speak the peace of God, and you speak the kingdom of heaven to invade that house, that's the confrontation of darkness. That's when darkness are pulled down. That's when the principalities come down. So you can do prayer walks until your legs are tired and you pray till you're blue in the face. If you don't stop preaching the gospel and getting people saved, the city does not change. Okay, so now we're into the gospels. So where do we find the man of peace? Who can mention a few men of peace and women of peace in, in the book of Acts? Sorry? Cornelius is the most obvious one. So you talk about him for a little bit. Yeah, okay. Okay, Cornelius. This is really an interesting example. Um, an angel appeared to Cornelius and tells him that his gifts to the poor and his prayers have come up as a memorial offering before the Lord. And therefore the instruction to Cornelius is to send to Joppa men to go and find Peter there and to bring him back to Cornelius' house. Now Joppa was three days away from, from Cornelius, from Caesarea, where Cornelius was. Now Cornelius would have done anything that that angel had told him to do because he actually saw the angel. Why do you think is the instruction of the angel that he should bring Peter there? But not he himself walk to Joppa. Keep him in the cluster. That's right. Somebody said, keep him in the cluster. Yes, because by the time Peter arrives there at his house, it says there when Peter entered his house, there was a large group of people waiting. And again, Cornelius, he would have walked the three days. He would have done anything. But that large group of people, they didn't see the angel firsthand. And it was three days away. They would not have done it. And in the same way, you might find that one person who's part of the cluster he is motivated enough maybe to come to your church. But his biker friends, drinking buddies, students or whatever, they want to sleep in on a Sunday morning. They're not going to be that motivated to get up and to come to church. But if you keep him in his house and in his cluster, that's where those sinner friends of his naturally come and go through that house. That's why you want to reach the cluster. This is so important. And so when Peter enters his house, now before Peter goes there, he has a trans experience, right? That sheet that comes down. Okay? Do you know why? He had to break through the barrier that was between the Jews and the Gentiles. There was this huge wall of separation. Do you understand there is between us and the church and the lost in America, there is a huge wall of separation? Come on. And it is keeping us out. We will find all kinds of reasons why it's not good to go there. And it, it's far more comfortable to stay here than to go. 
It is uncomfortable to get up on a Sunday, on a Saturday morning, and to go door to door is not comfortable. Some of you are freaked out even at the idea. You are scared you're going to get rejected, and you will. <laughs> but you will find many open doors. So, you see, he had to overcome this. He has the supernatural experience. Do you understand? We've got to push through this wall. I challenge you tonight. Let the Holy Spirit awaken something in you that you become a bulldozer to bulldoze this wall down between us and the lost and that we will get the church mobilized into the harvest. Okay, so he goes and he says, the Holy Spirit says to him when he reports back in Jerusalem, the Holy Spirit said to me that I should not have any hesitation to enter that house. Do you see how Jesus told them they must enter the house of the man of peace? The Holy Spirit comes. He is just like Jesus. He has the same mission to win souls for eternity. Same mission. Same mandate. Same mode of operation. He says, you must not hesitate to enter the house. Can you begin to see a pattern? Hello? Now, I can hear some of you say, now let's go to the next situation. The next one is in Philippi. It's in your notes there. Are you there? From Cornelius? The next, next one would be Philippi, if I'm right. So, in Philippi, before you look at your notes, how many men, men or women of peace do we read of in Philippi? Hello? Okay, you've got it, both. The jailer and Lydia. She says to them, if I am a believer in your sight, come to my house. She invites them to her house and a church is planted in her house. When, when Paul and Silas are having jailhouse rock, And the, the, the jail got rocked and they get shaken free and the jailer wants to kill himself. They explain the gospel to him. He and his whole household. You must understand they're going for households. And in a household, it worked this way. A household had, uh, you know, husband and wife, children. There could have been other siblings of the husband or wife living in that house and even an older mother or father or 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 other family there's often whole clusters of family that would in in these and it's still like that in some of these asian and middle eastern countries today plus the servants also hello so do you understand a whole cluster of people was in a house and they always went for the whole cluster and got everyone saved and then baptized in water all right, so then, uh, I think we skipped one. Uh, is it Pisidian? Uh, yeah, the, 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 yeah, that's not really a man of peace, but in Damascus, a, a, an ordinary believer goes to a house. All right, so then the next one is, and you see this, here's an ordinary believer that goes and lays hands on, 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 in Damascus on Saul, who becomes this powerful man of God, but an ordinary believer gets him baptized with the Holy Spirit. Isn't that awesome? So you don't know what your door-to-door -door will affect. What that laborer that you are getting saved is going to look like. Wow. So, Thessalonica. Uh, what's his name there? Jason. He's a man of peace. Do you see this? Again, all of these are harvest houses. Then the next one, Corinth. And I've listed three different ones there. You can have a look there. I don't have time tonight to go into all, all of them. But let me just show you what is happening in many of these cities. You know, then Corinth you see there. And then um, uh, we will look at Ephesus in a moment. But 
Uh, or, or yeah, let's go to Ephesus, Acts 19, and, and I want to take that whole situation and explain to you this whole picture now, what this looks like. So, Paul gets into Ephesus, and tomorrow night we will look at that first part where he finds these believers that are not baptized with the Holy Spirit. He gets them baptized with the Holy Spirit speaking in tongues and he baptizes them in water. Then he goes into the synagogue. Now there are many people that teach this that the church building is the synagogue. Have any of you heard that before? I want to say this to you. If that is so then either what lives in the synagogue is living in the church building or we should not look at the church building in the same way. <laughs> There's a reason I'm saying this. Before, earlier in your notes, you will see, and I don't have time tonight to go into it, but there's a whole section on the synagogue. I want you to go and look at it. And, and I've entitled the, 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 the subject there, Trouble in the Synagogue. And that's literally, if you go and study the synagogues out, you will see the trouble lived in the synagogue. First, in the ministry of Jesus, Jesus was not treated good in the synagogue. They threw him out several times out of the synagogue. They were upset with him. They were always angry with him. They didn't want him to heal the sick in the synagogue. He always had trouble in the synagogue. The spirit of the Pharisees, that institutional spirit of the Pharisees, that antichrist spirit, that attacked the ministry of Jesus. He was constantly at war with that spirit. And it's that spirit that eventually kills him. That same spirit, when Stephen goes to speak in the synagogue, gets him killed. That same spirit enters Saul. And Saul becomes the terrorist to attack the church. And he wants to destroy the church by going from house to house. Okay? And then he gets delivered from that spirit, but then that spirit starts to follow him. From synagogue to synagogue. Jesus said, you cannot pour new wine into an old wineskin. You see, we read things in the Gospels and we don't translate them to the, to the, new, uh, to the book of Acts. Jesus says, you cannot pour new wine into an old wineskin. Here, Saul goes every place. He goes into the synagogue, the old wineskin. The new wine of the new souls gets bubbly inside there. They upset the old order. What happens? The wineskin tears. Every time. And they get thrown out. And what is so powerful, once they get thrown out, the revival takes off in that city. What does that look like today? I'm not going to go there. You have to figure that out and, and, and let, let, let us not discuss that now. But, so Paul gets thrown out in Acts 19 and he goes next door to the, house, uh, to the schoolhouse, the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This was a larger building than the regular house that maybe had an upper room where they, the roof would be flat and they would enclose it in, in, in Acts 2 when the Holy Spirit falls in the upper room. Yeah, no, no, this one is a public venue. I'm saying this is larger than a regular house's upper room. In that upper room, they could fit 120 people sitting cross-legged. You can't fit 120 Americans into an upper room. <laughs> but you can Asians or Middle Easterners. <laughs> or Africans. All right? <laughs> um, so, so anyway... So don't think of a big hall like this. So they had this lecture hall. It wasn't a Bible school. People have taught for years this was a Bible school. It was just a lecture hall that he used. And for two years, he preaches and teaches the gospel there. And he does signs and wonders. Can you see that there? In, in verse 11, they, I, I, just open your Bibles in, 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 in Acts 19 and just check this out. I want you to see this. So he does this and he does signs and wonders that they put handkerchiefs on him and it spread throughout the region. And as those handkerchiefs are put on people, demons come out of them and they get healed. So tremendous signs and wonders taking place. Okay. Now, for two years, he's preaching the gospel in that building. 
At the same time, from that place, people go out throughout the whole province of Asia, Asia Minor, which is southern Turkey. Uh, sorry, western Turkey. Okay? Uh, it's not Asia that you think of China or, or India or whatever. This is western Turkey. And so in that part of Turkey, all, all the people, it says the whole province heard the word of the Lord in two years. Without the internet, without TV, hello? And without Paul going to all those places, but he multiplies himself in the new believers. Because understand this, there is only 12 believers there. There's not a huge church there. So he is reaping new souls. That is apostolic ministry. Is And as you look at Paul's ministry, he goes into a territory. He reaps souls. Harvest. That's the beginning of apostolic ministry. Then he plants churches. These harvest houses. How do we know there was house churches started? So... In your manual, you will see there, it talks of Priscilla and Aquila. Acts, uh, not Acts, um, 1 Corinthians 16, Corinthians is written, the book of Corinthians, because in that chapter he says that he's writing out of Ephesus. So, he's writing out of this revival, this book, to the church in Corinth. And so, as you read this book, yes, he's addressing stuff in Corinth, but he's giving to them also stuff that is happening in Ephesus and teaching those things to the church in Corinth. Do, do you understand this? So when you read the first letter to the Corinthians, it's not just what's happening in Corinth or what he's telling them needs to happen, but that same stuff is happening in Ephesus and throughout the whole province of Asia. Do, do you understand what I'm talking about? So, he says, this thing, that the church, Priscilla and Aquila, and the church that meets in their home, greets you. Harvest house. A church in a house. Can you see this? Do you understand? Paul is having this public meeting, but there's house churches being planted in the city of Ephesus. Not just Ephesus. You see there, it's, I show you there, Laodicea, Colossae, and many other churches, the churches in, in, in the book of Revelations, all of those churches come out of this. Smyrna, all of those, uh, um, Philadelphia, you can go and read that and, and see that. So there is a church planting movement coming out of this. Paul says in Acts 20, 20, I taught you both publicly and from house to house. Now, I want to say this, and, and leaders hear me. For too long in the body of Christ in America, as men and women of God, we have hidden in our church buildings and in our offices. It is time that we as men and women of God come out of the secrets, secret hiding place and that we go amongst the people and that we stop being so superior and that we have to have bodyguards and all kinds of stuff and be treated like rock stars. Come on. You, you, I know Pastor Scott is not like that and the pastors that are here are not like that. But you understand that mentality is in our church in America. It's time that that stops and that we as leaders get amongst the sinners. That we show the, the, the church how we go amongst the sinners. When we go door to door, I and Elena, we go walk with the people. When Pastor Scott and I went out to, three weeks ago, uh, uh, door to door, he said this, this is a level playing field. Because when you stand in front of that door, they don't know you're a preacher. <laughs> and they could give a rip. They don't give you no honor. And we don't operate like that to them. We don't tell them, I'm a man of God, I'm a pastor, you've got to address me that way. No, we do exactly the same as every ordinary believer are doing. A level playing field. But we've got to be in the harvest amongst the lost. Paul all the time did that. He followed the example of his master, Jesus. 
It's time that we begin to look like Jesus instead of Hollywood image. So this is the, the so he would minister both publicly and from house to house, and the whole church planting movement comes out of there. Then he even takes Priscilla and Aquila and a group from there, and he sends them to Rome, and they go and plant churches in Rome. Do you see how this multiplication just keeps on going there? Now. When Paul then later writes the letter to the Ephesians, to whom is he writing? To a church. But where's this church? Hello? This church in Acts 19. Hello? Can you see this? You've got a link, link Ephesus, the book of Ephesus, to this people. He's writing to this situation. Now what is interesting also, when you read Revelations where, where those churches are listed, none of them are listed as daughter churches of the mother church, Ephesus. It is continually a decentralization. Paul never links any of these churches either to Athens, to Antioch where he came from as he was sent out, or to Jerusalem. It continually decentralizes. But, so, he's writing to the church in Ephesus, and he talks about Jesus being the head, and every ligament, every part of the body doing its work. Can you see he's reflecting back on what he saw and experienced in Ephesus as he planted the church, and this multiplication happened, and the church arose and started to function throughout that region. And this is what he's reflecting on as he's writing the book of Ephesus, of Ephesians. Can you see this? How the different parts are doing their job with Jesus being the head. Then, when he then says to Timothy, in one, uh, 2 Timothy 2 verse 2, and look in your notes there, you'll see that passage there. He says to them, to, to Timothy, what you have received from me, and trust to reliable men who can teach others. So, let me ask you, how many levels do you see there? 2 Timothy 2 verse 2, what page is that on? 51. Somebody said four. So who are those four? Hello? Paul? Timothy? Right. So, Paul, Timothy, reliable men, others. Can you see that? So, do you see that he is telling Timothy that the multiplication that Timothy experienced with him while he was part of Paul's apostolic team there in Ephesus, that Timothy must continue that process of multiplication and not stagnate. When you now read the, the, the letters to Timothy, you see in them over and over, he talks about being a witness. F stir up the fire in you that you can go and be a witness. Do the work of an evangelist. Get the word out. Do you see he's continuing to stir this process of multiplication into the harvest that it will continue what has started there? But we have looked at the books of, of, of t the two books of Timothy as pastoral in terms of now maintenance. He's not looking at maintenance. And, and Timothy is part of the apostolic team. He is now really the apostolic leader in that city. So it's still apostolic. Rather, we've got to stop thinking pastoral and start thinking apostolic. All right. So do you see how this model from Jesus starts to unfold the new wineskin in this form of multiplication and that this is what Jesus wants to restore today in our day? How many of you are excited about that? Yeah. 
How many of you believe that it can be done? How many of you want to give yourself to see it happen? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we thank you for what you are showing us. Help us to shift and change and turn around and march into the harvest. Lord, there is this wall between us and the lost. And tonight we want to pray that you will help us to break through this wall. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Now, I want to do something, but I want to say this. If you need to leave, then the teaching part is over. You're welcome to go. I, but we want to just quickly minister to some people. So if you uh, need, need to go, then you're welcome to go. But if you can stay, then just stand up for a minute on your feet. I want to do something. How many of you have noticed all through as we looked at these commissionings, there's something that came out over and over that they had to deal with the demonic. Yet we do not often in the church want to deal with bondages and the demonic and really aggressively go at setting people free. So we are going to just quickly do a corporate prayer and we're going to release the power of God. And there's some of you tonight here, stuff is just right now going to come off you and God is going to set you free of some stuff just like that. So pray this prayer with me. Say, Father... I come to you in the name of Jesus and I confess to you that I am your child but I want to bring to you all the sins of my past before I came to know you that still relates to my old sinful nature and that has not been fully dealt with in the name of Jesus. I want to renounce them in Jesus' name. I want to break with every addiction in the name of Jesus. I want to confess every sexual sin and break with it and come into purity in the name of Jesus. I want to break with every kind of occultic practice both in my own life and in my family line. If there was any kind of uh, Freemasonry, I renounce it in the name of Jesus and I break with it. And with any other kind of witchcraft, in Jesus' name, right now, in Jesus' name, then I want to come and honor my father and mother and I want to forgive them for every area in my life where I did not receive from them what I needed or where there was abuse in the name of Jesus I also want to ask them to forgive me for all the trouble I caused them I recognize that in becoming bitter against them and judging them that I have sinned and that I'm responsible for my sin and the patterns that have followed. In Jesus' name, I want to forgive every person that has hurt me, that has offended me, and I want to ask you, Father, to forgive me where I have hurt and offended people in the name of Jesus. And I want to break with any generational curse 
and every ancestral spirit and every familiar spirit that has come down my bloodline in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that your blood, the blood of Jesus, sets me free and washes me clean. Thank you that the name of Jesus is powerful and redeems me and sets me free right now and that the power of the Holy Spirit sets me free from every fear and everything that torments me and my broken heart is healed by Jesus I receive now the forgiveness and freedom and I tell you Satan you have no right on me anymore in Jesus name your purposes are done in Jesus name I am set free in Jesus name now just raise your hands open your eyes and look at me and open your mouth and just breathe out as I rebuke these things in the name of Jesus right now I command every evil spirit go in Jesus name now every spirit of fear go in Jesus name every spirit of bitterness and unforgiveness go in Jesus name every torment of the enemy go in the name of Jesus right now right now every sexual spirit of lust go every sexual perversion go every pornography addiction go in Jesus name every homosexual and lesbian spirit go in Jesus name right now right now every addiction every slavery to addiction go your power is broken addiction to pornography addiction to uh, 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 alcohol, addiction to cigarettes and nicotine, addiction to drugs, addiction to prescription drugs, addiction to music, addiction to uh, games, addiction to, to work, to being a workaholic. All of this goes in Jesus' name right now. Right now in Jesus' name. I come against that performance spirit that you are never good enough, that you're always unworthy, that you always have to try and work to please. I break that thing right now. I want you to see the yardstick that you've always measured yourself with and have never been kept found uh, enough and that it's always, you always fail and you always judge others because of it and they always fail and you beat yourself with that yardstick. I want you to grab that yardstick in your hand and I want you to smash it on your knees and say, it is broken. I am free of that thing right now in Jesus' name. No longer a slave. No longer a slave. In the name of Jesus, right now, right now, freedom, 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 freedom. We release sonship, we release sonship, fullness of sonship right now. When the Son, when Jesus sets you free, you are free indeed. Shout for joy. It is this freedom that you have to go and minister to the lost. Wow. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. If you are not baptized with the Holy Spirit, with, with the evidence of speaking in tongues, we will minister that to you. If you need healing, there's people that can minister healing uh, also. And then um, if there's anyone that ne needs prayer, uh, we will minister to you. And then if, if you are not going to be here tomorrow night, then we want to lay hands on you also. Because tomorrow night we're going to have a special impartation, laying hands on everybody for this anointing of multiplication in the harvest.